X Amount of Comics, 1963 Elsewhen Annual, was written and illustrated by Don Simpson. This is what one might call a highly unofficial ending to the long-abandoned 1963 project, but it's actually a critique surrounding the reasons why it never concluded. So there's a ton of context that needs to be examined first before discussing this annual. As a refresher, 1963 was a series primarily done by Alan Moore, Steve Bissett, and Rick Veach. This series was a big deal for the new publishing company, Image Comics. Image was highly successful in sales, but the company lacked a certain level of prestige. Or, well, any prestige. As artists, they were definitely top-notch. But as writers, their ability ranged from intensely mediocre to outright awful. Yes, there were exceptions, such as The Max by Jeff Loeb and Sam Keith, and Savage Dragon by Eric Larson had a manic charm. But the majority of the titles by the founding creators had a lot of style and hardly any substance. A writer of Moore's caliber was a major acquisition for Image. By association, Image would be elevated from a company that published empty comics with pretty pictures to a publisher with a little class and style. Additionally, Moore had publicly disavowed both Marvel and DC and refused to work with either company. This aligned with how Image publicly represented themselves. They had also sworn off those two publishers. So it was like welcoming a kindred, highly respected creator into the fold. 1963 was planned as a six-issue miniseries to be concluded with an 80-page annual. The miniseries was published, but the annual never saw print. As the years passed, it became a project that would never be completed, despite various attempts by Bissett and Veach. Moore remained detached from the process and seemed ambivalent about it reaching its promised conclusion. I documented all of this a few years ago in a prior video. This brings us to Don Simpson. For those unfamiliar with the creator, he's primarily known for the superhero parody, Megaton Man, and the obscure but rather well-done science fiction series, Border Worlds. He was also one of the artists for the excellent series, Wasteland. Again, there's a video in the archives about that. Using the pseudonym Anton Drek, he produced adult comics such as Wendy Whitebread and Forbidden Frankenstein. He did leave the industry for a number of years, but he's recently returned and produces new material. Simpson created the 1963 logo and the first advertisement announcing the project. He also did the lettering for the first four issues and inked the third issue. So that's not an insignificant amount of involvement. At the same time, he wasn't active in the creative process of plotting, drawing, or writing the story. My intent isn't to diminish his work, but to put it in the proper perspective. According to Simpson, Veach fired him when he was unable to do a rush job on some lettering. Veach claimed Simpson was actually fired for changing some of Moore's words during the lettering process. Regardless of the reason, Simpson's involvement with 1963 came to an end. There is one more important piece of context, and that would be the short story in Pictopia. It was a story written by Moore and illustrated by Simpson. It was published in 1986 within Anything Goes No. 2, which was a benefit comic to assist the publisher, Fantagraphics. Yes, you guessed it, this is something I covered in an older video. In Pictopia has become a classic commentary on how superheroes and corporate interests have taken over comic book publishing. Over the years, on multiple occasions, Simpson fielded requests to reprint this story. He would contact Moore through a third party, who would then relay Moore's approval or disapproval and any terms he decided to impose. For decades, Moore approved the reprint and let Simpson and the other collaborators split the profit. However, when Fantagraphics offered to do a definitive, color-corrected reprint in 2021, Moore had a divisive provision. He would allow the story to be reprinted, but his name could not appear on the cover or in any advertising. Moore did not want his name associated with Fantagraphics, due to an insult he felt after they published an interview with Steve Bissett in 1996. What he specifically took offense to is an area of speculation, although one could read the interview and find areas that Moore might not have appreciated such as, quote, Once Alan essentially disengaged from 1963 after receiving his first checks, the tentative communication between Bissett and Veach and Image simply evaporated, and it was up to Rick and me to sort out the mess, unquote. As an aside, this interview is likely the major reason why 1963 will never be completed and why the characters were eventually split between the creators. 
Moore cut off all contact with Bissett after this interview. Naturally, Simpson was displeased that Moore was disassociating himself from a highly regarded piece of work over rather petty reasons. Not to mention, prior reprints were rather poor in Simpson's opinion. This new edition, using the original colorist's work, was a chance to preserve that story in a manner that was satisfactory and definitive. As any reasonable person would conclude, this preservation was more important than maintaining a grudge. However, Moore stuck to his principles, and the reprint moved forward with only his name appearing in the original credits. There, the context is established. Now let's look at X Amount of Comics, 1963, Elsewhen Annual. The story opens with analogs to the various 1963 characters in a void. There's another character, the psychic squid, who's a parody of the squid from Watchmen. These characters wonder what they're supposed to be doing and how long they've existed without a purpose. A group of disguised image characters and creators are then introduced. Naturally, a fight scene breaks out and the image characters are destroyed. It's quite intentionally anticlimactic and disappointing. The 1963 characters then lament the fact that they've never achieved their full potential. They were abandoned and forgotten. Simpson does take a moment to point out the three image founders who, essentially, use Moore's reputation for their own gain. The 1963 characters decide to find Alan Moore and get some answers. The Moore analog is a suitably egotistical messiah with a well-formed martyr complex. When the Moore parody is asked why there's no ending to their story, he responds with speculation. He states he probably had no idea where to take the story, so it had a lasting impact. It's here the characters resolve to improvise an ending, as suggested by Del Close, the legendary figure from improv comedy and the co-writer of Wasteland. From here, the characters literally wander through the graveyard that is Pictopia, meeting other abandoned characters. The story continues along those satirical lines, coming to something that resembles an ending and a beginning point for future stories. First of all, X Amount is loaded with references. The brief summary only contains a sampling of what to expect, and quite honestly, it's best if they're not covered in depth. Doing so ruins the sense of discovery when reading the comic. Format-wise, it's broken into chapters with title pages, like a classic comic from years past. Of course, this emulates the style used in 1963. Everything is arranged quite well, and the artwork is rather clear. However, X Amount isn't an earnest attempt to bring the 1963 saga to an end and provide closure for the fans. To quote something Simpson states in the back matter, this isn't the 1963 annual. It will never be the 1963 annual. It never was the 1963 annual. So if it isn't that, what is it? It's difficult to read X Amount as anything but a project motivated by pure spite. After all, the first page produced was a splash page directly insulting Moore. It was a page Simpson drew and then posted online as a whim. The positive reaction it received inspired him to flesh it out into a complete story. In my opinion, while Simpson is airing a few personal grievances, he's also being an advocate for fans who've become frustrated with Moore distancing himself from his work and the comic book industry in general. There may be many people who adore Moore's work and his contributions to the industry, but there's also a number of people that think he's an old grump with a big ego and a number of petty complaints. A subtle point being explored is that Moore displays some hypocrisy by complaining about industry practices, which is heavily balanced to favor the publishing companies, while simultaneously screwing over his fellow creators and their contributions. In other words, there's an imbalance of power between Moore and his contributors, who are subject to his capricious principles or whims. This is not exactly a fair point, but from a certain perspective, it's not entirely unfair. It's safe to say Moore has a number of hardcore principles, and that has led to some burnt bridges during his career. For some, this scorched earth approach does have its unfair side effects, especially when it comes to reprinting previous collaborations. And at a glance, some of those grudges are a bit absurd when a conversation could easily repair the perceived damage done. It's what professional adults do in situations like that. Remaining butthurt over a comment from 30 years ago is kind of ridiculous. That being said, Moore has allowed work he controls, like Miracle Man and In Pictopia, to be reprinted, but without his name and without taking a cut of the profits. He may not reconcile, but he does compromise. 
The point being, this critical area plays into the stereotypical portrayal of Moore as a put-upon, egotistical genius who dislikes the work that brought him to prominence. It's an oversimplification of Moore's entire career and his experience in the industry. Sure, I'll concede X amount is a parody, so using a flat stereotype is not uncommon. Still, it does have a very straw man quality to it. But again, since it's a parody and a satire, Simpson is under no obligation to be either fair or balanced. All that aside, X amount is entertaining to a degree. It does get a bit busy and seemingly introduces a bunch of characters at random, which at times makes it read a bit scattered. But it is focused, even though it does wander a bit here and there. Personally, I thought the ending was a little self-serving, but justifiable. Thematically, Simpson finds a bunch of discarded characters, takes them on a journey of discovery, and then brings them home, so to speak. Possibly, it emulates what might have happened at the end of 1963 had it ever concluded, so it is appropriate. Even though, in the end, X amount of comics isn't the 1963 annual. It will never be the 1963 annual, and it never was the 1963 annual but it's a decent satirical examination of why it isn't the 1963 annual. Originally, this was supposed to be a quick review. It was a topic someone requested, and I thought, sure, when I get my hands on a copy, I'll review it. After all, it'll be a good sequel to the previous 1963 video. This led to a rabbit hole of related topics and reading material. I couldn't say X amount is this, that, and the other thing without providing reasons why it was this, that, and the other thing. There was just too much context to discuss. Initially, I thought Simpson was basically airing dirty laundry, and perhaps playing into a certain perception that Moore is a bitter crank, especially during the essay after the illustrated story. Then I read his blog post, Why Pictopia Has No Author, and that changed my opinion slightly. The post contains Simpson's polite, rational request to Alan Moore to not remove his name from Inpictopia. Then it prints Moore's response. I would recommend everyone read it. I found it interesting and revealing. Although I think it's fair to say, Simpson's opinion became far more pointed during the three-year span between Moore's response and the publication of X Amount. Finally, it needs to be mentioned, Steve Bissett is allegedly working on a 1963 project using the characters he owns. Although, I also read he's retired, so there's that. There's also a fan-made version in the works called Giant Size 1963. Both have been in production for a while, with no specific publication date announced, at least none that I could find. I have no idea whether either will materialize. Thank you for watching, or listening, whatever the case may be. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, leave a like, and a comment. That helps this channel out, and it's a fine way of showing support for scripted, measured content like this. If you'd like to go a step further with your support, there's a link to my Patreon down below. Recently, I've started posting uncensored, quick reviews of new comics there. By that I mean I don't cover up nudity or any adult language. Otherwise, I'm my usual reserved self. Additional thanks to all my fine supporters on YouTube and Patreon. I appreciate every single one of you. Extra special thanks to... John Nowyux, Andrew Barton, Odin Ashcroft, Phil Sagan, Corey Drew, L.S. Gregor, Alexa Zernish, Brian Deaton, Johnny Lim, Steve White, Taylor Dull, and Matt Marino. You are all justified and ancient. Hey look, a playlist. Check it out for a variety of fine video products. Until next time.